Hello, runners and track and field fans. Welcome to episode number seven of Mr. Rubio Used to Run. I'm Joe Rubio, the guy in charge of things. This is my associate, Connor, and we have a very special guest. Do the I mean, intros. Look, Joe, every week we keep bringing in hotter and hotter, hotter. guests, and it is on fire in this room right now. We got 329, 1500-meter runner, world champion, Olympic bronze medalist. We got Josh Kerr. Josh, how we doing? I'm doing very well. It's been a, it's been a good couple of days showing off the brand, showing off some of the new products. So, you know, I'm excited to chat to you guys. I mean, your face is all over this convention. Everyone's asking about Josh Kerr. I'm like, we got an hour with you now, so <laughs> we're going to get into it. We're going to get, I don't know, ask some crazy questions and something like that. Where do we start? Well, we asked him about his surfing career. <laughs> oh, that's right. I, I searched your name because I didn't know anything about you before this podcast. <laughs> Never heard of you. Type it in. Surfer comes up mm. first. Who is the real Josh Kerr? It's a real issue, actually. Um, I think, you know, definitely it's, he's been around for a bit longer than I have, and it's always been my life goal to knock him off the first, first Google search um, because, you know, he's done well for himself. He's got a good couple of followers on Instagram, but I think it's more of a poser. I think he's more of a poser. I don't know if he's won. I don't know what the world championships in surfing is, but I'm not sure he's won that yet. But um, as soon as the surfing goes into the Olympics, then he can be back on the top spot. But this is, you know, we're going to do stuff like this, and we'll boost it. We'll, we'll be back on top in no time. How did you get into running? Uh, I've, I've ran for, for a number of years. It was mostly just to start, you know, training for other sports, like a lot of people, um, you know, but I think slowly but surely I found that there's no real luck in this game. It's about the, the effort you put in. It's about how much um, you, you kind of want to win and, and how much training you do and, and how smart you are with it. So, you know, I found that early on that, you know, your input is going to be your output. You know, there's no, there's no real disconnect with, you know, a bit of luck here, a bit of luck there. It's just like pure hard work. You'll find results. And, you know, I enjoyed that aspect of it. I enjoyed it being like, you know, if, you know, if I do something wrong, it's on me. It's not on a team of people. And if I do things right, I'm going to have some pretty glorious moments. So I fell in love with it from when I was about nine years old. And then through my early teenage years, I was like, I think I want to be, you know, the best in the world at this. And, you know, I, as soon as I started sport, I was like, I want to be the best in the world at a sport. And then when it was running, I was like, I want to be the best in the world at this. And, you know, it's taken a, a fair few years, but we're here now. And it's, uh, it's a nice feeling. And what's the name of your club? Uh, Edinburgh Athletic Club, yeah. Okay, and what's, where's it based? Uh, so it's in the capital of Scotland in Edinburgh, yeah. Okay. And I mean, look, a lot of talent has come out of this club. I'm, I'm starting to wonder what is in the water. In the, I mean, look, Jake, now you, Yeah. who's next? <laughs> no, hopefully me for a little bit longer, I will say. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think it, it, it just shows testimony to, to the club. And I think most of it is... You know, both of myself and, and Jake have, have kind of gone different routes after, you know, starting off in Edinburgh. You know, I, I left for university at 17. He left at 18 to go to university in England. And I, but I just think it's a mentality thing. I think it's kind of what was instilled in us when we were younger and knowing that there is a route to the top if you if you just keep chipping away at something. And I think that's what the success is bringing. It's like, you know, it's the mindset, it's the mentality to make sure that you know you're going to be able to get there if you just keep putting the work in. So I think uh, it is a big testimony to the club. Club and you know that's uh, you know that's our club and I still I still pay the club fees and uh, still put the <laughs> best on the British champs. So, yeah. yeah. How'd you choose New Mexico? Because you went to New Mexico right for college. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to University of New Mexico. Um, like I said, I went to university at 17. I got recruited at 16, so I was sending my emails out and I was like, you know, I want to go to U.S. University. I think you know that would be the next good step for me. It's uh, the closest thing I think to being a professional. And right. um, without you know, we used to not be able to get paid for it back then. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I sent in all these emails and all these coaches kept coming back to me. And they were like, look, you know, you're 16. Give it another year. You know, give it, please give it another year, all this stuff. And I was like, no, I'm coming out next year. If you don't want me now, I'm going to come to our university. And then, you know, the coach at the time, Joe Franklin, uh, sent me an email in the subject line. And it said, we want you. And that was it. And I, t I, t I emailed them back saying, I'm there. Tell yeah. me the date. And, uh, you know, I think we did a Zoom call or a Skype or something like that. And uh, I think he was at the indoor facility and he was like, you win a lot of races. That's why we want you. And we have mostly graduates. So you're going to be the youngest guy on the team. But I think I think we can, you know, we can work something out. And then I said, OK, right, whatever you need me to sign, I'll sign it. And uh, and, you know, he then sent me nothing. And I was like, well, I guess it's going to work out. And uh, then I emailed them afterwards being like, oh, by the way, am I getting a full ride? And he was like, yeah, no, I think you'll be fine. <laughs> so that was the important part for myself and my parents is, you know, going out and getting paid to go to university, which is a whole new world for us. And 
And, uh, you know, Joe trusted me then and I trusted him with, you know, with that part of my career. And he did a phenomenal job and I, I just love New Mexico overall. Awesome. What do your parents do? Um, my dad uh, is a financial advisor and my mom's a physio. Okay. Um, so I was able to get free physio growing up and stay away from injuries. And um, my dad used to play professional rugby. Uh, my brother just retired from professional rugby. Um, and so that was what I was going to go into. Um, but then I find running uh, through that process. So, though, yeah, it was just high level sport and staying away from injuries for, for growing did you, up for me. Did you ever get on the rugby field? Yeah. I got dropped into the twos, which is why I dropped the, the sport. <laughs> uh, I played in school, uh, so mostly for running in the UK, you run for a club. So I ran for Edinburgh AC, but in school you did rugby, uh, and that was that was my first, you know, sport in love. And I just wasn't big enough, and I wasn't strong enough, and I didn't quite understand the game as well as say my brother did you know um i think what people say when they look at me and my brother is it's just it's me and then you just zoom out a little bit like this and uh <laughs> and you get the way that he looks so uh yeah I, I still love watching the sport i think you know i follow scotland rugby as much as possible and my brother used to play in the english uh, premiership so it's uh it's a it's a fun sport to watch cool did you run across yeah, it was my first ever race. I, I, I raced across country, and I, I kept it in my whole my whole career up until uh, college. And you know, I think the first ever race I did, and uh, my brother won it, and I came second. And then we were walking down the shoot. I think it was a mile mile race, and uh, we were walking down the shoot, and I threw up on his shoes. And and that's <laughs> one of my fondest memories of you know he's just shouting at me, and you know we were nine and ten years old, and uh, you know he had threw up all over his shoes, and it was just the best. <laughs> and so that's you know that's Scottish cross country. We're all muddy and dirty, and you know we came away with a gold and silver medal. And uh, you know that's when I fell. And barf on his shoes. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> cross country running is a little bit different over as opposed to in America. It's a little bit soft here in California. A lot of people wear road shoes. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about some of maybe the hardest courses you've ran on. Yeah, the Scottish National Cross Country is uh, is a sight to be seen. Um, you know, they used to not be able to film it because it was difficult to get like camera equipment out there and like like having a lead cart. They wouldn't be able to get a lead cart through some of the debris that we have to go through. But you know, it, it, that was the fun part is you know going out there and being freezing cold and and just being a bit just getting tough, just getting tough with running. And you really have to love it. Uh, there's not really much glory in. Uh, Going out there for you know it was probably 5k when when back when I was doing it there um, and pouring rain and winds and, and horrible weather but you know that's I think that's where I fell in love with it and I knew that you know hard work is going to find success in this sport and um, that's kind of where the mentality starts. Right. How, what's the age difference between you and Jake? Uh, Jake Wyman is three years or four years older than me. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't necessarily compete with each other, right? So um, the photo of us two um, back in the day is actually, a, it's a funny photo because there was a, it was a three leg cross country relay and it was an under 13. So I was 12 or 11, 12 at the time. And passed it on to which, my brother, who gets cut out of that photo, actually, yeah. um, at the under 15. And then Jake Whiteman was the under 17 at the time. And, and we won the East District Cross Country Relays, which is, you know, it's one of those events that gets worse the more you explain it. Is it? <laughs> um, but, you know, it was really fun at the time. And obviously, we won that for Edinburgh. And, and that was the first time I'd raced with him. But yeah, he was a couple years older than me. But I used to get to watch him. We used to train at the same track every night. And so I used to watch him um, train away and, and get better. And his, you know, his parents were coaching him as well. So it was, uh, it's just fun to see like athletes like that training every day. Right. What was your progression like uh, at New Mexico, you know, from your freshman, yeah. sophomore, junior, senior? You did primarily 1500, right? Indoor, yeah. in, indoor mile, outdoor 1500, right? Yeah, I think, you know, when I came to college, the, the first thing people were telling me is like, you're going to you're going to have to move up at some point. And yeah. I was like, there's not a chance I move up to the 5K or the 10K. That just sounds terrible. I'm not really a big mileage guy. So I came into college running about 30 to 35 miles a week. Um, and then slowly but surely, it was just building up and building up. And uh, I found, you know, some solid success early in my first cross country season. They were going to redshirt me, but then I was like, I ran well in some sessions. And so they threw me into uh, some 8Ks and 10Ks. My first 10K at regionals, I dropped out and I got shouted at pretty bad. Um, and so it was, it was tough from that point on. But then it was just like, okay, I'm here now. I understand this process. You know, I, I made NCAA Outdoor final in my first year and I got 10th. And actually three of my current teammates were in that race uh, as well. I think they were second, third and fourth and I was 10th. And then it was like, okay, well, now I've familiarized myself with this, this competition level. It's time to go out and try and win. And that's when, in my sophomore year, I won indoors 
and then outdoors, and then in my junior year I won outdoors or indoors and third outdoors, and then I signed with Brooks. So I was still in college when I was with Brooks. I signed when I was 20 uh, back in 2018, and so I, then I finished off my uh, university career as a Brooks athlete. Cool. And what made you just decide to go to the beast? It kind of starts with um, kind of looking at the company as a whole, and just making sure that you can align yourself with the values of a company and, and things like that. And that was a, a big tick for me. Obviously, um, Brooks has an amazing presence in the running world, a very positive, very, very clean um, company where I can be like, this is a company I believe in. I believe in the ethics of everything. And, and then also um, alongside that, I could be involved in the product. I'm not a number at just a, a big company. I can be involved in, in what they're doing and, and try and give my take on some of, some of the products if, if I, was, uh, I was able to be a part of the process. And then from there, it's looking at the coaching staff and, and, and the athletes that are there and how they develop over their years. And, you know, I, I was lucky enough to be offered a contract in my junior year and, and um, I, I looked at it pretty seriously. And uh, I kind of told, actually sat down with the team and I said, um, if I don't sign this Brooks contract this year, I'm, I'm probably not going to sign professional. And I said, don't tell the sports marketing staff that because it really ruins my negotiating power. But <laughs> that is my, that's, you know, I was being honest with them because I loved Danny's philosophy. I loved um, that he knew I was good enough to win uh, an Olympic Games or a world championship. So that was, that was really it. I was just convinced by everything. It was like the product looked amazing and I was with a coach that could take me to being the best in the world. And then there's a, a team of people um, that were just a positive environment to be around. So yeah, it was cool. And I've been part of the team for, for coming up six years. Right. What are some of the little and not so little things outside of the training? You know, the, the X's and O's like, you know, recovery, uh, massage, nutrition, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think, I think what the beast does better than pretty much any team in the world is invest in the team. And so we have a lot of staff members, you know, on the ground every day. We have, you know, obviously a coach, assistant coach. We have um, our athletic trainer, Sarah. We have a nutritionist. So from that point of view, like that is a lot um, to have there every day. And then outside of that, we, we, you know, we're in Seattle, we're next to the, the Seattle HQ. So we're in, in the office every day, working with the sports marketing team, working with PR, working with footwear, working with apparel. And so we're really part of the company. And that makes a big difference when it comes to believing in the product and showing off the product and, and showing off the company as a whole and just being able to be part of that process. Yeah, but as an athlete, you really need to commit to these, these different things, like the nutrition and the rest and so forth. Uh, do you think that played a, a big point? part in making that final jump? Yeah, I think it, the big thing that I say is, that, you know, it's, it's quote unquote easy to be world, you know, championship ready. I think it's easy to be a contender at the world championships. It's very difficult to be a world champion. And, you know, I think there's, there's lots of levels to the sport. Like the Olympics is a great example. Being an Olympian is unbelievable. Being an Olympic finalist is even better. Being an Olympic medalist is another step. And then being the Olympic champion is that final step. And those steps get incrementally harder. And, you know, those are the 1% that you're looking for to be that next stage of athlete. And it's taken me since 2017 at my first world championships to realize how much it takes um, making sure I'm, I'm talking to specialists about sleep, about nutrition, getting the right, um, you know, PT, getting the right massage, making sure that every 1% is there. And it takes, it takes an absolute village of people to allow that to happen. And uh, that's why, you know, it's taken me, what, eight, five, six, seven years to, to try and make it to the top. So going into that Olympic Games, did you know that you were maybe a medal contender or did that almost come a little bit as a shock? I think everyone has that first shock of like, oh, I'm one of the better guys here. Um, and that was the buildup for me. I'd ran more of a low key season. I hadn't run any of the Diamond Leagues in 2021. So I hadn't really been up against the big, the big guns, really. Uh, but I'd ran fa like fast enough where I was ranked top five. I'd been six in 2019, and then, you know, obviously we had an off year in 2020. And uh, I think I came in and someone ranked me like third or fourth, and I was like, oh, that's an Olympic medal right there. And um, it's just wrapping your head around it, because if, if you're not going to believe it, then no one else will. And, you know, seeing that for the first time and speaking to some teammates, I'm like, well, like this was months in advance, you know, um, and I was like, OK, like this is this is a big moment for me. And, you know, 2024 was always the big goal. I think this that was the one that like for the right age and, and, and you know, maturity to, to really get after the goal. 
um, but this was a, a really fun opportunity um, in Tokyo. So yeah, it was it was a big transition and it was difficult, but I, I thought I could win when I was going in. When I was running the rounds, I was like, okay, I'm good enough to win this. And um, and yeah, I was able to just battle away and, and you know, it was the fastest Olympic final in history and I was able to, to come away with a, a bronze medal. And then you come off that big race and then look, Jacob, Jakob is the guy. Yeah. Every, he's winning every race, he's setting records, but you come into that race, I don't think anyone maybe thought that you'd be able to pull out that win coming down that home stretch right by him. What was going through your head? Did, did you know you had that race with 50 to go? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, training had been really, really good all season and we had really worked on the transition of just making sure we're ready to go when, when the time comes. And, and for me, like, and winning races throughout the season doesn't really mean a lot to me. It's mo mainly about, you know, the big one at World Championship Olympic final. And so we, we were in a really good position coming in. We'd trained um, to a T, everything had gone extremely well and you're never really in that position. It's very difficult to get everything right for one specific day, especially when it's months and months in advance and just getting all the training right. And so when I stood on the start line, and I knew it was my day. Um, I, I, I mean, even arriving in Budapest, I knew it was going to be my competition. And it's just, you know, you work so hard and you cross every T and you dot every I and you're like, well, you know, no one else can take that away from you is, is the hard work that you've already done. And I'm, you know, I, I knew I was never going to let that opportunity pass. And, you know, you, you can't affect anything of what anyone else is doing on the day. And so you focus on yourself and you have to be happy enough with what performance you put out there. And that was, I knew I could run probably 327 high, 320, 328 on a really good day. Um, and I thought that's what it would take to win it. And so I just focused on that. And if I could run that fast, I was going to be okay with walking away with whatever, yeah. whatever it was. And uh, obviously it was a little bit slower than that at 329, but I was able to, you know, when the door opened and the opportunity presented itself to win, I was going to grab it with both hands. Yeah, Connor's a big uh, Ingebrigtsen fan and I'm not. <laughs> so in our building, uh, we were watching that race and no one could figure out why I was yelling and screaming for you. I was using a lot of words too. Uh, you that. probably heard it <laughs> at the race. I mean, he was yelling so loud. Uh, and something to the effect of, <laughs> you cocky. <laughs> I'm glad you got beat. You, you know, but it, I said a lot louder. Yeah. But yeah. I think that kind of rivalry, I think that's what the sport needs. It, we need those excitement. We need half the people cheering for you and half the people cheering for Jakob. It, yeah. it brings excitement and it gives people a reason to watch the sport. We. We need more people to watch track and be invested in it. Yeah. And like, do you still, do you now consider you yourself rivals with Jakob? Um, you know, I think for me, I, I think that's what it's been built up as, um, <laughs> for sure. I, I think he's very, I think he's one of the best and fastest 50 meter runners in the world. That's just a fact. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show that respect for sure. And I think, um, you know, the work that he has to put in to be as good as he is, I have a lot of respect for. And I don't always feel the, the common respect there. So that's where I feel like the rivalry is. Um, but I, I truly believe I'm better on one single day than he is. And, yeah. um, you know, when the lights are on and the pressure's on, I'm, I'm just a better athlete. Yeah. And so that's, you know, that's always how I feel. I feel like I'm the best athlete on, you know, in the world on the day. And I've ran a season best or personal best in the final of every major championships I've been in. And that's going to continue. And so... You know, if, if people want to go after fast times and have a really long season, then, you know, they can do that. But come the Olympic final, I'm going to be there and I'm going to be a real problem. Cool. As far as your training right now, I know yeah. we don't talk about like exos and stuff like that, but there's a lot of tempo work, a lot of just long, long intervals and stuff like that. Like how much of a break did you take after, after Budapest? Um, I took about 10 days um, off, of, off of running. And then from there, I started running a little bit uh, now and again, just because, you know, the body forgets how to run pretty yeah. quick. And it's a pretty stupid thing. Um, but just getting 15 minutes every day, get the action of running in. And, you know, training's going fantastically since right. starting up again. I started up properly again, uh, start of October. Um, you know, we obviously extended the season a little bit through September and, you know, took some time off and, and we're, we're back into sessions and things like that. So now we're just, you know, putting a roadmap together of how to be really good uh, in August and, and go from there, really. It's just another, another, another go round and, uh, you know, an Olympic year is a special year. It's excitement across the board. It's excitement in every part of the running community and every sport in the world as well. So it's a, it's a whole new venture and I have my Olympic bronze medal and, and I'm, I'm, I'm bored of the color and I want to I get an upgrade. <laughs> With an Olympic year coming up, 
is it hard not to look at other athletes like Jakob or, you know, some of these runners running really fast times and just stay in your own lane? Yeah, I think, I do think it's difficult for people to do that. But for me, it's, I can't affect what anyone else is doing. It's, it, it genuinely is. I sit down in a meeting with, with, with Danny and I'm like, okay, how can we run this fast on this day? And I can't affect how fast anyone else runs. And I think that's where blurred lines come into our sport is, you know, if you can focus on yourself and push your body to the limits, then that's great. And you have to accept whatever result comes your way. I'm not win at all costs. I'm, you know, how far can I push my body on the right day? And that's it. And I think that's kind of what I, I love about, about the sport is, you know, the pressure and, and everything that comes with it. And, you know, I'm going to work on the mind, I'm going to work on the body and, and, and I'm going to be good to go. But yeah, I think the sport throws a lot of curveballs as well. And um, it's just, you got to focus on your own journey. And, you know, I'm sure there's going to be lots of cool, annoying setbacks along the way, but I'm going to stay focused on it. So tell us about your warm down after your world championship title. It's actually a good question if I did one or not. Um, you know, for what, me, what did you do to celebrate afterwards? How's that? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I did about two and a half hours worth of media and then peed in a cup with a man staring at me. And then I took a golf cart to get an Uber to one of the one of the bars to spend time with um, the, Bro the Brooks employees there, everyone that was working on everything I was wearing uh, in terms of footwear and apparel and uh, and, and PR and, and, and sports marketing. And I was able to spend time with my parents, my fiance and, and family members. And uh, uh, Jake Whiteman and Neil Gurley also came out and spent time with me because, you know, we know how hard it is to, to do what, you know, what I did and what Jake has done. And, you know, Neil's, N Neil knows exactly um, what it takes. And so it's, it's just a big respect moment. And it was awesome spending time with them as well. Awesome. So tell us about the warm up with Atkins for the World Championships, how'd that come about? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I think our main job once, you know, once I'd crossed that finish line and, and obviously showed, um, you know, spoke to the media and spent time with family and, 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 and Brooks overall, it was just about what can we do to add value to, you know, the other Brooks athletes that are there. And, you know, I, I had a phone call with Danny. I was like, what do you think would help um, in terms of, you know, Nia's uh, competition? And he was like, well, I think just some familiarity with, with uh, warm up and, and making sure it just feels like another normal day because it was her first world championships was you know my first world championships I was 37th I think and and she was she was six so you know she did a, a heck of a much better job than I did and and so my job was yeah just to go there and and, and warm up but so I did that for the semi-final and then for the final we had a, um we had a big Brooks dinner like an hour before which obviously Neil wasn't at but yeah. um you know me and me and Isaiah were at and you know, we were bevying a little bit and we, uh, <laughs> we just had like they just brought like so much food out and it was awesome. It was like this beautiful place in Budapest. And so we did that. And then we were like, oh, like it's, t it's time to go. We're going to go and jog with the And we were we like turned up to the warm up track, like like in our jeans and our, like a button up shirt. Yeah, and, like, with had steak a nice in your watch belly. on and steak <laughs> in the belly and champagne in the belly. So. You know, I was looking at him and I'm like, I feel horrible, you know, <laughs> but you're like, you've got a teammate there that's going to be in the world championship final in about an hour's time. So obviously it's not a time to complain about us having too much steak and champagne in the body. But, and so we went with a jog and on a jog with her and we yeah, had me and Zay just kept looking at each other like, we need to not complain right now, but I feel horrible. I thought I was going to throw up, but you know, Neil was locked in and she was doing her thing and we were just there to just chat rubbish. You know what I mean? Just chat pish to keep her, keep her mind off of, um, obviously a very stressful environment and just trying to keep it light and, and easy for her. Right. So you really dig the team environment. Yeah, I think it's important. I think, you know, we thrive off each other. We, we built this team or Danny's built this team specifically, uh, in Seattle and, uh, I think, you know, over the past even four or five years, it's just leveled up and leveled up and leveled up. And, uh, you know, we we thrive off each other, but we also just learn from each other's experiences. You know, I had ran three rounds um, in the stadium and Nia had only ran one and Zay had ran one. So it was like we were just like talking about, you know, different call room stuff and, you know, timing on things and then food and, and all this stuff. So it was just, yeah, everyone's got different experience. And I think it's, yeah, I think it's easier to learn from each other than, than just your own experience. So obviously picking Brooks, the team was one factor, but mm -hmm. I know you also mentioned being a part of the process of designing shoes, building shoes for your needs and help people run their fastest times. And I mean, I heard that you were a big, a big player in the development of this shoe. Uh, what can you tell us about it? So I think you're giving me too much credit. The, the <laughs> Spike team and the, the, you know, the Blue Line team and, and, and all the footwear teams are amazing what they do. But what they do better than anything is, is decipher yeah. 
the rubbish chat that we give them and, and like the terrible lingo that we try and say. They're like, oh, this is, this is sticky and this isn't flowing well. And they're like, okay, there's definitely words we can use for this that, <laughs> that kind of fit into what we're doing. But I think that's, that's, my, that's my biggest um, love of, of Brooks is being able to have a, a hand in some of the, the products and being able to be used because, you know, we're the ones out there trying to push the limits in, the, in these, uh, the, this equipment. And I think, you know, if this spike's ready to run, you know, 144 and you know 329 then it's ready for for everyone you know um and you know for me i think there was uh th this iteration of uh you know of the hyperion L um, ld is just it's just you know head and shoulders above anything that they've created before and you know it's taken months and months and years of of you know looking at things and i think they said there was like 15 different uppers they tried on it and you know there's a, it's a whole it's a whole new concept and i think it just wraps your it wraps your ankle and, and heel really well and it just feels like an addition to to your foot and that was a big thing we wanted is we don't want to be thinking about the spikes that's something that we always kept saying is like if we're thinking about the spikes that's a problem uh, and and this is just like you're getting propelled forward you're really being aggressive with it but you're able to come back for three rounds and 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 be able to come back in the final day and still be able to rip it what was that transition like from normal traditional spikes of not too long ago now to the super spikes i mean look you go back to 2015 2016 yeah. it's a whole nother game now yeah, I think that's been really hard on a lot of companies uh, because I think I jumped in an old pair of spikes from like college and I was like, oh goodness, these, I don't know how I even ran in. I think the biggest difference is that you can come back and run the next day. Right. And that's what's made the rounds um, faster at the World Championships, made the rounds faster at the Olympics is because, you know, the athletes are able to recover because, you know, the, the footwear departments have an idea what they're doing with the foams now. And, you know, we have the new foam in, in, in this spike as well. And it's just like, it's like no other, but they, they create foams out of thin air. I don't know where they get them from at this point. They're just, every year there's I mean, like a new foam. You go downstairs and look at this. It's outrageous. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean that they're amazing at their job, and 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 I think it's so it's so cool to just see everyone doing their job. Like you know, for for me to do my job properly, everyone else kind of has to do the, do the same. And so seeing like the footwear department really work and do their job properly, it just makes me so excited to get out there and do mine. And it's just that hand in hand process. You know, uh, we don't ask this question a lot, but it's it. You would think you know you won the world championships, you get uh, Olympic bronze medal, people are going to sit, sit at home and say, those are his the best races he's ever run in his mind. Mm. But I, I'm asking, what is your best time? What is your best race? It could be something in high school, something you feel super proud about, something that it could be in college. I mean, obviously the world championships, you feel super, but it could have been something, in, you know, when you're a kid. Yeah. I don't know. Just yeah, I think you're. I think you're right there. Everyone has kind of their opinion on whatever the, you, you know your best race is. I think for me, it's at different stages. I had different mindset changes, and so you know, in college, winning indoors the first time in 2017, like the race that I ran against Cesarek, that was a mindset shift. Okay, like I I knew I was going to win an NCAA title at some point in my career. But then I knew that as soon as I won one, I wasn't allowed to lose another one until I signed a professional contract. And so that was a mindset shift of, okay, you can actually see it when you watch the video. I crossed the finish line and it went from like, oh my goodness, I can't believe this happened to like, oh wait, I'm the champion now. I will not get beaten. And, and that, was, that was always the mindset shift. It's like, okay. Like, and then when I came to the professionals, um, you know, it took a little bit longer to familiarize myself within this you know, set of guys and to try and be the best. But it, you know, I was able to do it and, and now I'm here. I'm like, I, I'm not gonna lose again. Like at the major channel, like I'm okay like losing through the year, it's fine. Like that's my, that's my kind of progression through into the major. But you know, when it comes to that major championships, nothing but gold is gonna be acceptable. Awesome, congratulations and good luck. I mean, we've got a lot to come from you. I mean, I think this is just the beginning. Um, we've got an Olympic cycle coming up. Is there any kind of last preparation that really you feel like is going to get you set to medal or maybe take that number one spot come uh, 2024? Yeah, I think, you know, rolling with the punches is always important when it comes to an Olympic year. Everything isn't going to go perfectly. Everything isn't going to go the same way as it went the previous year. And so just being adaptable, being a little bit malleable when it comes to problems. Uh, and then just, yeah, I think the, the Olympics, especially like the Olympic Village and then you know, Paris as a whole is going to be crazy. Uh, and so just knowing that that's coming and, and having things set in place where like I have the experience from Tokyo, I know what certain things are going to be like and just know that when things come my way, I'll have answers to, to solve problems. Um, 
Because as an athlete, like it's not as easy as just, you know, turning up to the start line and, and, and going when the gun goes off. It's the whole process of the travel and the holding camps and the media and then, you know, staying in a cardboard bed like in Tokyo and then, <laughs> you know, go, you know, staying in. I think the call room in Tokyo was 70 minutes. So being in a call room for 70 minutes and then doing three rounds of that. Like it's a stressful environment. So you've got to be ready for anything that comes your way. But, you know, the Olympics is not like no other. I think, you know, that's what excites me right now. And I'm, I'm just I'm just pumped to, to try and get to another one. Awesome. Hey, sincerely appreciate you being here and a sincere good luck this year. Thank You're you. You're going to kick some ass. Appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. Do. Sweet. Oh, what else? We got we got to do the, the general like, comment, subscribe, <laughs> ask us questions. We'll try to answer. Yeah. Yeah. You know. We had Craig Engels on. Now we had Josh Kerr on. <laughs> maybe next time we get the two together, we talk shoes. <laughs> maybe do a little celebrity boxing. I don't know. You never know. A lot more to come. <laughs> but thanks again, Josh. No cool. problem. All right. Peace out. Thanks, man. Thank Perfect. you.